I've been preaching about covenant, but I want to take a, uh, a morning off and just have a topical sermon. I w I've entitled this A Day in the Life. A Day in the Life. There was a famous Russian novelist. Uh, well, he was a, a, a dissident. And his name was Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He came to America and lived up in Vermont. My wife and I thought we'd go up and try to visit him. We went up and got to the gates, but he was busy packing to return to Russia, and he didn't have time to receive us, but we talked to his son, Ignat, and uh, got his address and was able to communicate with him a little bit. He wrote a, many famous novels. He was a, one of them was called uh, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. He was exiled to a prison camp for many years out in Siberia. And there, the hardship of life living uh, in this prison camp was so bitter, so difficult. And the whole purpose of that book is just a whole novel chronicling uh, the life and the time and the hardship, that the drudgery and how slow time passes uh, in one 24-hour period in a Soviet labor camp, a day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. There was a Beatles song on the Sgt. Pepper album, A Day in the Life, and they did the same thing. They wrote a song taking uh, scenes from a person's life, from getting up in the morning, going to work, coming home. Have you ever, as Christians, been burdened down by time and being regulated by time? It seems like we're always in a hurry. We're always trying to run the red light, the yellow light, because we're running late. Uh, time can be monotonous for many people with the boredom and the drudgery. And I thought about, as I was reading the Bible in my private Bible studies, I noticed that many of the Gospels are so careful to pinpoint what time of the day certain great events happen. And I was amazed because people have been keeping time since the creation. And they had, were able to measure time, and they had clocks. And I thought, what if I was able to take, I can't do all of them, but what if I was able to take the most famous uh, times in the Bible and preach a sermon and just go through a 24-hour day and talk about the meaning that it held, and maybe that can help us today as we run in this rat race of life and, and try to draw meaning from life. And Ephesians chapter 3, 16, we heard this morning, there's famous 3.16s in the Bible. You know John 3.16. But what about Ephesians 3.16, which says that we should redeem the time and make our best use of time. And so this morning I want to preach a message called A Day in the Life, and it's a day in the Christian life. It's a day in the life of God because God gave time. And let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for this assembly the precious saints of the congregation of God, the great kingdom citizens. And I pray that you would bless us and bless your messenger this morning as we expound the word, a topical sermon, just talking about the great clock and, and how that the writers were well aware of the time of the day and the time of the hour. And Jesus, as long as he walked, knew about that great hour that he would have to lay down his life. And that was his purpose. And Lord, we need to lay our lives down. We know that there's going to be that last hour. We know that at some point that clock is going to strike 12 and uh, there's a great ball that we have to attend and I pray that we won't be turned into pumpkins by the devil but that we'll be able to get into the auditorium, into uh, the great city and when the gates close and are locked, Lord, I pray that we will be uh, in the fold, found faithful, faithful unto death and hear the great tidings of joy well done, thou good and faithful servant. Be with us this morning, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before I begin, I want you to know that God created time. And that's why he gave the light bearers. Everything that measures time in, uh, today is governed by some type of astronomical clock. Now, the earth had been created, and it was spinning on its axis. Now, the sun and the stars, the moon, had not been created. In the Bible, the sun is called the greater light. The moon is called the lesser light. 
The greater light ruled the day, the lesser light ruled the night. Now the light was not the sun. The light was the light emanating from the Lord and the Godhead and the glory because Revelation says in heaven, the heavenly city has no need of the sun because the glory of the light is the Lamb and the Lamb is the light. Praise God, Jesus is the light of the world. But God saw the light was good and God separated. In Genesis 1-4, he separated the light from the darkness. Now here's the first mentioned principle. If you want to know what the word day means in the Bible, look up the first time it's used. And that'll give you the definition. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, there was morning one day. I'm using the New American Standard this morning. Day one. Now, a lot of people say, well, how do you know that day is a literal day? And it's true that in the Bible, there's sometimes the word day could be used as a metaphor, as a figure. But we know that, that this has to be a literal day because it's a, it's a reference to the rotation of the earth on its axis. You have one day. That is an evening and morning. And the light he called day, the dark he called night. So the first definition, the first proof is that it's a light dark cycle. Number two, it says that the day began in the evening. You know, the Jewish people, their calendar is not like our Roman calendar. They begin their day in the afternoon and they conclude uh, the following. They begin in the evening, they conclude the following afternoon. So a Sabbath to the Jew is a Friday night, Saturday afternoon experience. And of course, the Jewish calendar came first. The Hebrew calendar is the first recorded calendar we, that is still in existence today. Day one. Now in Genesis 1, 14 through 21, later on God does create the stars in the sky. He creates the sun, the moon, the stars. And he says, let them be for days and years. And so we got rotations and we got revolutions. The earth is rotating on its axis. And when it makes one complete rotation, that's one day. That is an evening and morning period. But when the earth makes one complete circuit around the sun, that is one complete revolution, you have a year. So that means that makes the day literal because how can a day be a million year time period when God is contrasting days and years? That is, he's talking about rotations and revolutions. And then it says, let them be for signs. Now, there were 12 signs in, uh, to the Hebrews. There were 12 signs uh, of that year. And as you looked up into the stars, what these patriarchs did was they mapped out the 12, se the 12 months because they were lunar periods and they looked up at the, at the stars and there were 12 constellations each year. And those, we know those 12 constellations today as the zodiac. Now, the zodiac is in the Bible, Job 38. We're well aware of that. It wasn't meant to be fortune telling or divination, foretelling the future, all of that is witchcraft. It's an abomination to God. It was forbidden. But the, the 12 constellations in the patriarchal era was simply starting with Virgo, ending with Leo. It's, it spelled out the gospel story. And I don't have time to go into that, but you can read about it, that each of those, the meanings of the symbols of those 12 months. And of course, you had 12 constellations as the earth traveled during the, the year on its trajectory around the sun. And it just so happens that each uh, month of that sign also pertained to the lunar cycle. So you have a new moon. That's where you get the word month. One day it dawned on me. The word month comes from moon. And that's where we get Monday. Sunday is the day of the sun. Monday is the day of the moon. And it all came together for me. And so God said, let it be for days and years and signs and seasons. And so everything we have to measure time comes from the heavenly orbit with one special exception, and that is our seven-day week. Where does the seven-day week come from? What in the heavens operates every seven days? And the answer is nothing. Our seven-day week comes from creation because God worked six days and rested a day, and that's where the seven-day week comes from. And in fact, one of the most spectacular evidences to prove that the literalness of the day is not in Genesis, but it's in Exodus, the Ten Commandments. Ex Exodus 20, verses 9 through 11. God says, I want you to honor the Sabbath, keep it holy, 
And then he tells you that I don't want you to do work on it. Even the visitors coming to visit you, your uh, employees, your maid servants, all of those. He says, I want you to honor that seventh day. And then he tells you in verse 11 why. He says, for in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore, he hallowed it. So God is basically saying, I want you to work six days and rest today. In your 52 weeks of the year, he says, because I worked six days during creation and rested a day. And that is absolute proof because you're dealing with the whole week in retrospect, proof of the literalness of the day, proof of the day of creation. No millions of years in the Bible because you can't have God working for six million year age periods and resting a million year age. It becomes absurd. So God defined the day. Now, I want another verse in John 11. Now, this is when they were getting ready to go heal Lazarus. And Jesus delayed. Sometimes God delays. Have you ever prayed to God and you wanted an answer to your prayer, but God delayed giving you that answer? There's a reason God delays sometimes, because it's a proving ground. It's a test that we have to endure. And God wants to see if we will wait on him. And the Bible says in Isaiah that those who wait on God, God will bear you up. And you'll run and you won't get weary. And he will give you eagles' wings and you'll be swift as eagles. You'll run and you won't be weary. And that's because we've got to wait on God. And, and Jesus was delaying the healing of Lazarus. In fact, Jesus was going to let Lazarus die to show his glory, the glory of the resurrection. And as Jesus was delaying, he was speaking to his disciples and they asked him about the journey there to Bethany. And Jesus said, are there not 12 hours in the day? And so already the day had been divided. One r rotation of the earth is a solar day. It's divided into two segments, just like God divided it, the light from the darkness. And somehow they came up with the number 12. Now, I wonder how they got the number 12 in the Bible. I don't have time to go into typology today, but I know 12 is a very important number. And they divided the day, into, that is the light period, into 12 increments, and they divided the night into 12 increments. And so we have 24-hour days in the Bible. Can you believe that? And Jesus said, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now I want to talk about the nighttime because we follow the Romans and our day begins at midnight, doesn't it? We call it post-meridium and anti-meridium. And we began at, at 12 a.m. That is early morning, the midnight. And there were some great things that happened at midnight in the Bible. One of them is in Acts 20 when Paul heals this guy named Eutychus. Now, you've, heard, you've listened to some long sermons over the years, haven't you? Haven't you ever? Let's face it, uh, I've been there myself. The preacher gets a little long-winded. And you can only hold somebody's attention for so long, right? And you begin to tune out. You know, I, I, I don't get upset if you tune out while I'm preaching. I really don't. I just have one requ request. When you tune out, just make sure you tune out in the Lord, okay? Maybe you're hungry, right? And you're thinking about Jesus turning, you know, the rocks into bread, right? Maybe there's a sporting contest. There's a big girls' basketball game today, and one of the... One of the uh, benefits of meeting here in the Holiday Inn here in Harrisonburg, Virginia, is that the opposing teams get to stay here. And I was able to meet several of the girls' basketball players uh, from the University of Virginia. They're in today to play the James Madison, and it's a big game today. The NIT tournament is down to the Elite Eight, and after today, it'll go down to four. And so I was just given some greetings. But maybe you're thinking about the basketball game. Maybe you're thinking about what you're going to eat. Maybe, you know, it's, it's surprising to think, because, and I know because I, I'm human myself and I have thoughts. And I, you can always count <clears throat> on the most ungodly, irrelevant thought to come in our head at the most crucial moment. One of those crucial moments being coming around the table of the Lord. The time when we should be focusing on the body and the blood of Jesus. And you can always count on the devil. Nobody ever interrupts you when you're, when you're having, you know, when you're doing something that is not important to the Lord, if it's not kingdom relevant, 
you never get interrupted. But when you try to focus on kingdom things, that's when we get the interruptions, the distractions. Have you ever listened to the Bible on tape? Some people would listen to the Bible on tape. How many uh, at night when you're ready to go to sleep and you listen to the Bible on tape, or maybe you're praying and you fall asleep praying? How many have ever done that? There's nothing wrong with falling asleep praying. Look at Eutychus here. Now, you've got to remember, Paul, is, uh, his ship is going to depart in the morning. And you don't always have the Apostle Paul with you. We didn't always have Jesus with us. Remember when they came to Jesus and said, why don't your disciples fast? And Jesus said, look, when you got the bridegroom, you don't fast. But when the bridegroom leaves, then you fast. And there's a time to fast, there's a time not to fast. And Paul is in a hurry. He's going to leave. And they didn't have the, the Apostle Paul with him. They had him on one evening. And they wanted to take advantage of him. And so he's preaching all the way to midnight. Now, how would you like that? How would you like to listen to a preacher all the way to midnight? You know, really, it, it, you, you really show where your conviction is, where your commitment is, don't you? Because what's more important, the Lord Jesus Christ or getting a good night's sleep? And I'm going to talk about nighttime because I'm amazed at how Jesus was able to sleep. When I read the Gospels, it's always like when they're rowing in a boat across a stormy sea and it's going to sink. And in, in the times, if you look in the Gospels, when Jesus is, is asleep and he's getting a, a rest, it's a time when all hell's breaking loose. And there's a sermon in there somewhere but I want to finish midnight here because it says they were listening to Paul's message. He was going to depart the next day. He's continuing his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they gathered together, and in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul healed him. Paul healed him. It's one of the great midnight stories in the Bible to worship God at midnight. Now we have the wee hours of the morning. In Mark 6, this is the one that got me. This is the one that inspired the message this morning. Jesus uh, can't get a good night's sleep. He's going across the Sea of Galilee. Now there's 10 cities, what I gather, called the Decapolis. There's 10 villages around the Sea of Galilee. And from like 8 o'clock, if you picture this, the Sea of Galilee as a clock, from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock, those are all the big-time towns. There he's going. Capernaum, Chorazin, all the towns that Jesus said, woe to you, because they rejected the gospel. And Jesus had just got done healing the Gadarene maniac. And the Gadarene maniac is down at around 4 o'clock. And Jesus wants to go back. And then Nazareth is on uh, around 6 o'clock. So Jesus goes back to his own town, Nazareth. He gets in a boat. And he wants to go back to Capernaum, which was kind of his headquarters in that Galilee area. So he puts the disciples on that boat in Mark chapter 6, but he himself is delaying so that he can pray. And you know what's going to happen. Here they are trying to row across the Sea of Galilee, and here comes a wind blowing up and a storm. Now Jesus isn't with them. That's another account. That's another gospel account where that, the, 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 Jesus is laying on the bottom of the ship and it's sinking. This case, the, the 12 disciples are rowing across the lake. The wind blows up, and they're rowing and rowing, and every time they shoot their uh, sextant to get their latitude and longitude, it comes back that they're not making any progress. And it says it's the fourth watch of the night. And if you have your translation in Mark 6, 48, if you have your footnote, the, now they take those 12 increments, and you divide them up into watches. Each watch constitutes three hours. And something else I learned, which we'll see very shortly in the next uh, parable, is that their time began at what not the same as ours. Their day would begin at 6 a.m., and their night would begin at 6 p.m. And we can tell that when they tell you what hour of the day it is. What hour. But this is the watch. You see, there's four watches of three hours apiece. It's the fourth watch. This is the last watch of the night. It's somewhere between 3 to 6 a.m. 3 a.m., rowing in the middle of the, of, the, of the lake. And lo and behold, they look over, and here's Jesus walking. Now, can you imagine? What a sight. Have you ever been out on a stormy sea? Have you ever been out on the lake with your boat, and it gets rough? 
and choppy and the waves start to get high and you start to get concerned. I've been there and you know, you get that queasy feeling in your stomach where you don't know if you're going to make it or not. And up in Canada, the water just thawed out. Supposedly, you'll, they told us you'll freeze to death before you drown. Well, three to six in the morning, and Jesus is walking on the sea. They look over, and he's walking, and he would have passed them by. Now, Jesus, of course, he knows everything. You can't hide from God. God knew where Adam and Eve uh, was in the bushes and Jesus knew where these men were but can you imagine Jesus there was kind of an object lesson here he's walking by as if he's gonna walk ahead of them and they're looking over and they think it's a ghost and they're crying out and Jesus walks over climbs in a boat and boom peace is still he didn't say peace be still that's the other version it just the wind stopped and the waves stopped but I'm just amazed that you know the tribulation that takes place in the night and that's the object lesson. You know, Jesus is near to us. When we're in the tribulation of the nighttime of our life, and the devil is trying to get us in that storm, that maelstrom of life, that tribulation we're going, to spiritualize this story, Jesus comes near. Jesus comes to them. He's walking on that sea. Isn't Jesus incredible? He walks right on top of that storm. Jesus has subjection and dominion over the elements. He has subjection over the, the wind circuits of the earth. I mean, you study meteorology and you, you come to something where that you just can't predict it. You have these computer models and study chaos theory, but the truth is nobody knows where those winds are coming from and where they're going to go. But Jesus does, and Jesus can rebuke the winds. He can rebuke demons and disease, but, but even the elements of the, of the earth, he can rebuke them, and they all bow down in adoration to the King of kings and Lord of lords. And if Jesus can cast out demons, and if he can rebuke the elements, and if he can rebuke diseases, can't he lead us home to heaven? And we got to make sure that we don't let Jesus pass us by. And so there they are, the four watches. Kind of reminds me of that country music song, Shift Work. You ever remember Shift Work? 7-Eleven. I don't know where they get the 7-Eleven. I worked at Rubbermaid, you know, the factory. And, and the shift work, everybody wanted the first shift. It was three shifts. Eight to four. Second shift was what I worked. Four to 12, that was terrible because, you know, unless you got up early, that was the only, your morning was your only time you had alone. And eight to four in the morning, then four to 12, the second shift, and then later on in college we came home, the graveyard shift, 12 to eight. That wasn't so bad. 12 to eight, eight to four, four to 12. Well, they got four watches, beginning at night, 6 p.m., six to nine in the evening, then nine to 12, the second watch, 12 to three, the third watch, three to six, the fourth watch, and that's the time when, when the devil's after us because he wants to get us in the nighttime. Psalm 30, verse 5 says that joy comes in the morning. And you ever wonder why it's so hard to get a good night's sleep? Have you ever had so much stress in your life and anxiety and your nerves and you, can't, you lay down and you can't even go to sleep? And I'm just amazed. Look at Jesus, the Lord of Lords, and how easy he can sleep during the storm and why I have such a hard time sleeping in the storm at night. But you know something? Jesus created this earth, didn't he? And... Uh, Jesus is God, but Jesus is also a man, and he can identify with our weaknesses. You know, beloved, if we're in Christ Jesus, and we die in our sleep, you know, as little kids, we pray that song, now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep, if I die before I wake, pray the Lord my soul to take. You know, there's a lot of truth in that song, because if we're in Christ Jesus, you know, what if the ship goes down? What if we perish? What if we drown? We're in Christ Jesus. All we're going to do is be translated to the eternal realm. And maybe that's why Jesus could sleep at night, because he had his gaze fixed on the eternal heaven above. His anger is but for a moment. I'm so glad. You know, God is, is a good father. He gives us a spanking. Yes, he does when we need it. But I'd rather be spanked than to be grounded. You know, I never like grounding, you know, because it just lingers and lingers. You go on and just drags on. I'd rather be like David. You read people in the Bible, they want to take their punishment and they want to get it over. 
And that's the kind of God we have. Yes, he gets angry, but his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Now tell me God's not good. When we sin, he's angry. It has to be dealt with. But his favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now there's some other things that are going on at night. The night is the devil's moment. It's the devil's hour. When was Jesus taken? When was he betrayed? When was he arrested? At night. They could never have arrested Jesus in the daytime. And that's why the court, the business world, the legal system, everything is done in the day. You don't do things at night. Yes, you can apprehend the criminal, but he'll have to spend the night in a tank. The judicial proceedings don't take place at night, except for the arrest of Jesus. Can you believe that? Who is the light of light and the light of the world. And he was arrested at nighttime. Why? In Luke 22, Jesus tells us why. Jesus said to the chief priests, the captains, and the elders of the people, he said, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? You know, it's amazing. You coming out with me as a thief? These guys were more interested in, in uh, preventing some, a robber trying to lock up their locks and lock up the building and tie Jesus up. And here he's the Lord. Every day he was teaching as a rabbi in the temple of God. And they're treating him as if he's a thief. They're going to try to get some kind of burglar alarm and buy new locks to put on the doors. You, can, you, you know where their heart's at. You know where their mind's at. Jesus said, when I was with you daily in a temple, you did not try to seize me, but only Luke's version says this. Not Matthew, Mark, nor John. Only Luke's records that last part that Jesus put in there. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. You see, the nighttime, it belongs to the devil and the power of darkness. And that's spiritual darkness. That's a spiritual power of darkness. And this is your hour. I don't want the night to be my hour. I want my hour to be the daylight hour. When Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, we were watching this uh, documentary, like a Christian documentary, and I just thought maybe Nicodemus came like, you know, around 9 p.m., 8 or 9 p.m., 7 p.m., kind of like when we had our church service. But the movie had Jesus sleeping. It was in the middle of the night, and there was a knock on the door, and they woke Jesus up. Nicodemus is here to see you. And I thought, you know, that's probably more like it. This guy was so afraid of what people thought about him that he didn't want to get caught, so probably Jesus was sleeping when Nicodemus came to him by night. And Jesus said, you must be born again. And he said many other things. He talked about uh, John 3, 16, that God loves those. He loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus talked about how that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness and how he would be lifted up. And then Jesus went on to say that wicked people, evil people, despise and hate the light. In John 3, 20, 21, he concluded that discourse with Nicodemus. He said, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. And so we need to be light bearers, and we need to let our light shine, this little light of mine as Christians. Now there's another great teaching in the Bible. This is probably the greatest uh, parable pertaining to the measuring of time, and it's the laborers in the vineyard. And this is where we're at this morning, beloved. We need, there's work to be done. There's work to be done. And this is the most important thing, I think, the uh, point that I'm going to make is that, yes, the devil tries to get us in the night. Joy comes in the morning. But now the morning has dawned, and there's work to be done. And we've got to get up out of bed and get to work for the Lord. Literally, figuratively, metaphorically. The kingdom of heaven, Matthew 20, verse 3, is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a day's wage for a day, he sent them into the vineyard. And he went out about the third hour. Now, I'm going to get to the third hour. It's 9 a.m. That's, that's when Jesus was crucified. That's when the church began on the day of Pentecost. We'll get to that. He went out the third hour. 
it finally dawned on me, the third hour, what would be the first hour? That would be 6 a.m. You see, the day began at 6 a.m. The third hour is 9 a.m. Are you with me? So you have 12 hours in the day starting at 6 a.m. You have 12 hours in the night starting at 6 p.m. That's the Bible time. It's the same as our time today. So they began to work at 9 a.m., and he saw others standing in the marketplace. And to those he said, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever's right I'll give you. So they went. He went out at the sixth hour. He went out at noon and beckoned them in to work in his vineyard. Then he went out at the ninth hour. That's 3 p.m., 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He's still beckoning them to work. He goes out one more time, two hours later. The 11th hour is 5 p.m. Now, that's quitting time, isn't it? For us today, but for them, they still had one more hour. They worked 9 to 6. Did they have a lunch break? I don't know, maybe. It worked out to 9 to 6. But he went in the 11th hour. When you see the 11th hour in the Bible, that's one more hour, one last hour to go, the 11th hour. And, and according to the Scripture, it's talking about the end of the work day. 6 p.m. 5 p.m. is the 11th hour. One hour to go. 6 o'clock is quitting time. And beloved, there's a great sermon there. We can't give up. We can't quit. We can't quit at 5 p.m. We've got to finish that work day to 6. We've got to finish our day, finish our life, finish our course. Working for Jesus. You know, the good thing about the Lord is that there are some rank sinners that can spend all of their life doing evil and... It's, it's very rare. I, I don't recommend this to anybody. But there are some people who are able to repent in the autumn of their life, and they can be baptized into Christ, obey the gospel, believe, receive the Lord, be obedient, and they are going to gain eternal life just as those who have got in at a young age and been working for the Lord all of our time. And they'll get the same heavenly reward. Well, there were some workers who were jealous. And they, they were upset. They said, well, he's, I don't have the rest of the, the parable here, but they said, you know, these guys have gotten the same wage, the same denarius as we who have borne the heat of the day. And Jesus said, is, my eye evil, uh, is your eye evil because I'm good? Didn't I promise you to work for such and such a wage? He said, go your way and take what's yours. He said, the first will be last, and the last will be first. And so, beloved, we need to work for God. Ephesians 3.16 says, redeem the time, because the days are evil. We need to wake up. Wake up. That's the problem today is we have lethargy. People like sleep. Proverbs says, woe to the man who sleeps a little slumber. A little folding of the hands, tossing and turning on a pillow. Poverty will overtake that man. we got to wake up. we got to have a good work ethic. But we've also got to wake up spiritually because there's a lot of people slumbering, slumbering in the church service, slumbering in their Christian lives. Paul said, some of you are sick, some of you are weak, and some of you are spiritually dead. God forbid we reach that point where we're dead in Christ, dead in the Lord. In Romans chapter 13, verse 11, Paul says, Do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Do you know the Bible says we're still working out our salvation? You've got you to hear the word to be saved. You've got to believe in Jesus to be saved. You've got to repent unless we perish. Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You need to confess Jesus. We need to be baptized. The like figure of baptism now does save you. But the Bible says that you've got to work out your salvation every day. And even today, beloved, salvation is nearer than it was the day we first became Christians. We've got to be sober-minded and, and not slumber. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of the light. Romans 13, verse 12. Now, I talked about the third hour, 9 a.m., Jesus was crucified, 9 a.m. Now, what, what really hurt Jesus was he didn't have, before he went into his crucifixion, he didn't get what, what most prisoners get today. They give him a good night's sleep. They'll even give him like this kingly breakfast, you know, like a steak, and they'll give the guy whatever breakfast he wants before they execute him. Can you believe that? Just so we can be humane. 
How do you like that? Kind of a contradiction, isn't it? The warden gives the prisoner whatever breakfast he wants before the execution. Jesus didn't have the luxury of a meal. He didn't have the luxury of a good night's sleep. He was beaten and tormented all night. He was in torment praying to the Father. The blood, uh, uh, the sweat began to drip as droplets of blood. And then when he was taken in the garden, and they had the trial, the midnight trial, Annas and Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin. And now at 9 a.m. they bring him to Pontius Pilate. And he's going to be crucified. In Mark 15, Mark gives more of the times of the day, uh, my observation, than any other gospel. Mark seems to be more conscious. And, of course, Mark, people believe, was written with the Romans in mind. In Mark 15, 22, then they brought him to the place, Golgotha, translated the place of the skull. They, tr they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. Jesus refused the narcotic before the pain of the crucifixion. Isn't that amazing? He was going to take it, and he was going to take it with every nerve in his body, even though every nerve in his body was now going to become his enemy as it recorded and transmitted the impulses of pain to his brain and to his nervous system. And they crucified him and divided up his garments among themselves, casting lots for them to decide what each man should take. It was the third hour. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. I was just reading how important that the inscription was. I looked up the word title, uh, superscription, depending on what translation. Do you know that written document was so important? And what they nailed on the top of the cross, there were three things. They had to tell your name, where you were from, and what your crime you committed to be executed, to be put to death. They had to have your name, where you were from, and your crime. That's why it was very important that every gospel said, this is Jesus, he's from Nazareth, his crime is that he's the king of the Jews, and that's why we're killing him. And God put it in Pilate's heart to put that last, he gave that last word to the Jewish people. And what the commentary said, what the scholar said, was what was nailed to the cross was the exact replica of the legal document that was held in the court archives. And so what was nailed to the cross was kept in the filing cabinets of the Romans' court system. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And that's why the enemies, that's why the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin were so upset, they were mad, because this is going to go down in the annals of history now, that the reason they crucified Jesus was because he was their king. And they didn't want it. They didn't want it in the courtroom. They didn't want it in the archives. They didn't want it in the public domain. Are you with me? And they went to him and said, don't say that he was the king. Say that he said he called himself the king or that he said he was the king. And Pilate said, what I've written, I've written. And that, import, that superscription was so important that even Pilate, once it was written and confirmed, even Pilate himself could not change it. And beloved, those archives are still in effect today, aren't they? Alive and well in the hearts of men. Jesus crucified, 9 a.m. But the church began at 9 a.m. On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, the 50th day after the Passover, Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. These men, these apostles are not drunk. I don't know what heckler it was there in that midst who threw out the charge that these men are filled with new wine. New is not kynos or neos. It's a bad translation. It's glycogen, glucose. And glucose was, is sugar. It's a highly... Uh, fermented beverage that could intoxicate quickly. And they said, these men uh, have gotten drunk on this uh, highly fermented gl uh, glucose wine. And Peter said, these men are not drunk because it's nine in the morning. And men, drunkards, don't get drunk at nine in the morning. They're hung over at nine in the morning. They're not drunk. But this is that which was spoken of the prophet Joel. It shall be in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all the earth. This is the most important day for the church of Christ, for the ecclesia of Christ. This is the birthday, Acts chapter 2. I know many religions have no idea what Acts 2 is talking about. They have no idea what the Acts of the Apostles. In fact, there are some people that would never even turn to the Acts of the Apostles because they don't know how important Acts dovetails with the four Gospels. 
the chain. The day of Pentecost is the hinge upon which those doors turn, upon which salvation is given. The Gospels were written that you might believe Jesus is the Christ, and by believing you might have life in his name. But Acts tells you what you must, be, what you must do to be saved. Jesus came that he might establish his church, and he gave the keys to Peter, the keys of the kingdom. And he said, whatever you bind, I'm going to bind. Whatever you loose, I'm going to loose. But Peter took those keys in Acts chapter 2, and he unlocked the kingdom of God on earth and began that great church of the Lord. And that began at 9 in the morning, 9 a.m. But now we hasten to 12 o'clock p.m. That is 12 o'clock noon. Back to the foot of the cross. Jesus was crucified at 9, and his lifeblood ebbed out, and they put the spikes in his wrist and in his ankles. And it says the sixth hour came. Three hours Jesus endured the agony. We left him at the foot of the cross at 9 in the morning, but now it's 12 o'clock, it's noon, and Jesus, his blood is still uh, pumping and being poured out, and his life's blood is oozing and ebbing out of his veins. And it says at 12 o'clock that there was darkness. Now, isn't that fitting? Because the time at noon, it should be when the sun is directly overhead. That should be what we call the apogee. The sun is 90 degrees vertical on top of us. And yet, it's 12 o'clock. The sun should be directly overhead. And that's when darkness overtook that Judean land and that cross, that Golgotha hill. And darkness fell over the whole land all the way to the ninth hour. From 12 in the noon to 3 p.m., darkness. And Jesus cried out at the ninth hour. That's three more hours. That means he was on the cross from 9 to 3, six hours now of torment as he hung upon that cross. And he cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, translated, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? And the bystanders heard it. They said, he's calling for Elijah. He wasn't calling for Elijah. He was calling for Elohim, the name of God of Genesis, the creator God, the sovereign God, Elohim. That's who he was calling on. And God forsook him. And the darkness, God poured out darkness because that was the time when Satan's power was in effect. And God as it were, surrounded the foot of the cross with that darkness to hide the sin, to hide the shame, to hide the curse. Cursed is the man who hangs on the tree. And Jesus bore that curse, and he was naked on the cross. I don't know if you know that or not. They filled a sponge with the sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave him to drink. There were two times when they gave the drink. One Jesus refused, the other he took. He took the drink because he was thirsty. He refused the narcotic. Jesus uttered a loud cry. He breathed his last. Yes, there was darkness. Jesus died at 3 p.m. and suffered on that cross. Six hours total. And yet, at 12 o'clock, when the darkness fell from heaven, in the middle of the agony, in the middle of the six-hour agony, at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, when darkness came at the foot of the cross, there was a light that struck Paul down on the road to Damascus. And can you imagine the same zenith of the sun as it baked that Middle Eastern world, and it's a hot climate over there. And yet, when Paul was on the road, his name is Saul at this point, to Damascus to persecute Christians. And he's sharing his story here before the king, Agrippa. And he says, at midday, O king, he says, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun. And that flashes back to the creation, because the light of the Godhead was emanating upon the earth. And even the plants that were created on the third day existed for one 24-hour period before the sun was even created. Now, how do you figure that out? And the light of Christ is so brilliant and so luminescent that it outshone the very sun, the great star of our solar system. And the sun began to fade away. And, beloved, I finally figured out when there's a solar eclipse, the earth is passing between the sun uh, the, uh, and it, the sun is eclipsed. The moon passes through between the, the earth and the sun. And with a lunar eclipse, the earth passes between the sun and the earth. And the earth, the sun is turned to darkness. 
And the moon, when it's eclipsed, turns red to blood. And, and what the Bible is saying in Acts 2, prophetically, what Joel was saying is that the light of the glory of the new covenant is so bright and so brilliant that it totally eclipses the solar system. It eclipses those heavenly bodies which govern the Old Testament economy, the feast days, and do the Passover on the first month and the 14th day of the month, and so on and so forth, because the Jewish people had holidays and rituals and feasts. But now in the New Covenant, we don't have any more dates. We don't have any more months and days. Now we have a first day of the week. First day of the week. And Paul said that sun at midday, and it was so impressive to him to see the sun that was turned to darkness at the radiance of the light of Christ. And he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the cactus thorns. And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. But get up, stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you. I'm going to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you've seen, but to other things which I will appear to you. And so Paul became a witness. He became a testimony to the Gentiles. Yes, it's the ninth hour, 3 p.m. It was the hour of prayer. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John went up to pray to the temple. And we should pray in the afternoon, shouldn't we? We should be men of prayer. Daniel prayed three times a day. This was just when the apostles went to the temple to pray. There was a met a lame man on the way. He wanted money. And he was there. The gate there was called Beautiful. It was a beautiful gate. You can study the temple, Solomon's Colonnade, so on and so forth. This guy for years had laid at that door begging money. Peter and John said, we don't have money, but there's something we can give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And he didn't say, uh, oh, no, don't touch me. I don't want to lose my disability. Not like people today. He was glad to be healed, and he was healed because it was a day of prayer, and we ought to be in prayer to God. The ninth hour, 3 p.m. Finally, we have the last hour. First John says, children, it's the last hour. And I had another version. Uh, it says it's uh, the last time. But it's last hour. You've heard Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know it's the last hour. Now, the last hour for the Jew would be, as I told you, it would be 5 p.m. But what I did was I, in my mind, since we begin our day at, at the midnight, Basically, I'm, I'm saying that the last, our last hour would be 11 p.m. What I'm doing, I'm making an analogy here. Who knows the hour? No one knows the day. Now, Jesus knew his hour. He says, my hour has not yet come, speaking of his death. Jesus knew the very hour that he would be delivered, betrayed, and crucified. We don't know when Christ is coming. John goes on to say, don't be deceived. Who's a liar? The man who denies Jesus is the Christ. People are trying to deceive us. What's the point here? We can study about the Antichrist, the Gnostics, and all those things, but, but the point being is that John is warning the Christians that it's the last hour and people are trying to deceive you. And if you give in to deception, you're going to forfeit everything you've got, everything you've earned, your covenant, your standing with God, your relationship, your security. Everything's going to be forfeited if you allow the devil to deceive you. And you know, I think that's not a very fair battle, is it, to stand up against the devil? But remember, what did we get when the day we were baptized? Didn't we get the Holy Spirit? Didn't we get Christ in us, God in us? Didn't, get, didn't the Lord give us equipment and armor that we could go to battle against the devil? Didn't he give us a sword? We have no excuse for being deceived by the devil except to blame ourselves for not loving the Lord enough that we would be deceived. And that's what it boils down to. The Bible says God will give people delusions, 2 Thessalonians 2. Why? Because they love not the truth. If we don't love truth, then we're sitting ducks for deception. If we don't love tr the truth, God would rather that we would be deceived, and he'll help us to be deceived because it comes down to our heart because the fool says in his heart there's no God. And that's where we're deluded, and that's where we're deceived because we just don't love God enough to find the truth. Now, it's the last hour for us, beloved, but I want you to know something else. It's the last hour for the devil, too. In Revelation 12, 12, Rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. 
Just because the devil's alive and well, we can still have joy in our heart because the victory is ours. That's what the book of Revelation means. Christ will prevail. But he says, woe to the earth and the sea because the devil has gone down to you. He's filled with fury because he knows his time is short. My cross, short. Just a micrometer. Micro minute. The devil's time is short. Beloved, the end is near. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded. We need to keep our minds clear and unpolluted. Amen? Keep our minds focused on Christ. That's what the devil's after. He wants our mind. I don't know why a lot of people today have nervous breakdowns. Christian people have bad nerves. Throw in the towel. Why? Because we don't keep our mind clear. It's like an addict. People get Alzheimer's. It's possible that we could get spiritual Alzheimer's if we don't keep that addict clean, keep it pure, undefiled, clear-minded, self-controlled, so that we can pray. Yes, beloved, it's the last hour. I prayed about Cinderella. You know, that's a, that's a pretty impressive story, isn't it? And uh, she got this fairy godmother and just totally reconverted her life. But the devil, the wicked stepmother, where do they get those stories at? You know they're all gospel stories, right? Can't you take all those guys down and break them down? Cinderella, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, Pinocchio, all those stories are gospel stories. She goes to the ball, the Christian life, but remember, she's got to be out of there at midnight, right? Well, it's kind of inverted, but the story holds true. We've got to be faithful unto death. We've got to be faithful till the clock strikes 12, amen? Because we don't want to be turned into pumpkins. We don't want to be turned into horses, and we definitely don't want to be turned into mice. When Jesus comes back, you know, there was a parable of the virgins. They kept the oil for their lamps. The oil was the Holy Spirit. And there were some, half of the virgins, ten virgins, half of them ran out of oil, and half of them preserved their oil, enough to last through the night. We got to keep our oil preserved, don't we? And that's the purity of the gospel. That's the faithfulness to the covenant. That's why I've been preaching about covenant. That's why we're talking in Sunday school about commitment. We want your oil to be replenished so that you won't run out when the Lord comes back. Is there anybody today outside of Christ still in the domain of darkness? Anybody need to be converted into the dominion of the light? the kingdom of the dear son? Is there anybody that wants to be converted to become a Christian? Is there anybody today that has backslidden and would like to repent and be restored and give a testimony? Wouldn't that be great? Isn't that just as good as Jesus said salvation? Even when the lost son came home, he's restored. This man, salvation has come. Whether we're in Christ, whether we're out of Christ, God is a God who restores. He loves us. He cares about us. Make sure you set your clocks according to the Lord. Let's come around the Lord's table. Amen.